So uh, this, uh, this piece is Beach Sweet by Marnie Marie. Um, Marnie has uh, been with Workhouse for quite a long time and uh, has been really inspired uh, <laughs> by uh, being at home, uh, working during COVID. As you can see, this piece is not literally lemon and lime, but it is more inspired by the colors. Uh, this is uh, Morning Light on Rachel Carson Park by Phoebe Twitchell Peterson. This is Opposing Ideas, number two, by Lynn Goldstein. And then uh, Lynn, as you can see, has, uh, has a really great use of color. Hasn't come up yet. I apologize. Let me try that one more time. Here we go. There, yeah. As you can see on this one, uh, lemon and lime has definitely inspired the color on this piece. Uh, Lynn frequently uses uh, oil pastels or pastels to get a really uh, vibrant color. And she paints a lot of uh, paints and draws a lot of landscape pieces. That's really what inspires Lynn. <clears throat> this is The Piano Room by Michelle Montalbano. Okay, that one hasn't come up yet either. Oh, no? It's slow for some reason. Hmm. Yeah, we're still seeing Lynn's. Let me... Try again. So um, there you go. Yeah. There we go. Michelle is one of our newer odd uh, artists on campus. So I have to admit, I don't know a lot about Michelle yet. That's very cool. But, but as you can see, as she does some very cool uh, room and setting pieces that I, I agree do. that's a beautiful interior yeah they take you really physically into the room that she's in and and has great detail like the wallpaper and that kind of thing right. <clears throat> next is uh reflect by monica stroic and uh please do let me know if the image is not coming up yeah, we're still seeing Michelle's right now. Okay. okay. That's it. Yep, there you go. Monica uh, uses a lot of math and uh, uh, spatial uh, objects in her pieces. They A lot of times they make you think of windows or doors. And you can see here, uh, Monica too was was inspired by uh, the color of lemon lime. But she, all, a lot of her pieces are reminiscent of architecture or geographic shapes. All right, and lastly, we have This and That by Denise Phelan. Okay, Denise is the one artist who took the lemon lime literally. So she shared one of her still lifes with us. Uh, uh, a lot of Denise's pieces have a lot of whimsy in them, and and this is one that's like that. You get all these little bits on somebody's table, but including things like pill lemons with the stickers from the store still on them. There's a lot of, to look at in her pieces sometimes. And she's another artist who uh, uses uh, a lot of vibrant color in her work. 
And uh, I have been sharing everybody's contact info through chat if you're interested in uh, contacting any of these artists. And then I'm sorry, uh, Audrey, did you put Phoebe's up? Phoebe's, I believe I did, but they, that may have occurred uh, when we were still having uh, some. Yeah, I don't issues. recall seeing it. So if you could put Phoebe's up again, I'd appreciate it. Absolutely. All right. All right, here we have Morning Light on Rachel Carson Park by Phoebe yeah. Twitchell Peterson. This is a park that's uh, up in New England, up in Maine. And uh, I love this piece partially because I drive by this park a few times every year and she has done it great justice. Um, I also want to make note of it, not to, not to take the focus off of uh, Phoebe, but because um, we have another artist with us tonight who we'll talk with a little bit later, uh, Kathleen Best Gilman. Kathleen also does a lot of uh, work uh, that is New England landscapes, and I believe she also does a Rachel Carson Park <laughs> painting as well. <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, Phoebe does a lot of landscapes herself, but she's also uh, frequently uh, inspired by the beach. She has a lot of beach pieces, not necessarily your typical beach pieces. She uh, she likes painting things like the legs that you see when you are uh, laying on the beach yourself. She doesn't put the whole person in. She also will do pieces of people who are in the water. Uh, I, I really like her pieces. She's another one who uh, uses a lot of vibrant color in her pieces. And as you can see, she is great with water reflection, which is really hard to do. And so is Kathleen Beskillman. Okay, uh, Audrey, thank you so much. Uh, I think we'll move on to, uh, well, actually first, does anybody have any questions about any of the W5 art or artists? No? Okay, we'll move on then to building uh, W6. Uh, the featured artist in uh, W6 this month is uh, Joan Hutton. Joan can't be with us tonight, but we'll show uh, a piece of her work and we'll talk about Joan for a little bit. Her uh, show this month is called Experiments in Fiber Art. And Audrey, if you can show her piece, I'd appreciate it. Absolutely. There we are. Okay, this piece is called uh, Blue Moon, uh, I'm sorry, Blue Moon Roses. And uh, I think it's interesting that Joan shared this piece because this piece is not actually uh, fiber. It is dyed paper and oil pastel collage. In fact, if you look at it closely, you can see the paper because there's writing on it, but the writing actually gives it a nice little it, uh, detail. It kind of helps with the shadowing on the piece. So Joan's an interesting artist because she doesn't feel that she needs to stay within a uh, fiber, obviously. <laughs> but she uses a lot of different uh, art media to uh, create her pieces. And as you can see, she's just as skilled in uh, using the oil pastels as she is in using fiber, which Joan Hutton makes uh, a lot of pieces that are uh, fiber art that you hang on the wall as well as uh, wearables. Uh, and uh, she is another artist who uses a lot of vibrant color, as you can see in this, a lot of rich uh, greens and blues and purple in this piece. So uh, if you get a chance to come to campus, I recommend stopping by because uh, Joan really can expand on uh, what you think a fiber artist uh, does. Okay, uh, I think we will move on to Building 7. Um, our featured artist for Building 7 is with us tonight, Sandy Martina. Sandy Martina is a glass artist and uh, 
is a W7 is a glass building. All the artists in that building are glass artists. So uh, Audrey is going to uh, share Sandy's work with you. And Sandy is going to tell you a little bit about it, starting with her logo. Yeah, that's my little marketing uh, promotional piece that I did. Um, and of course, the, the background is a piece of glass that I made and just took a picture of and uh, put some type on it. And I made a couple banners, I made some business cards, but uh, I always like to, to uh, kind of play around with, with some of my glass that I'm gonna be featuring in my show. My background, of course, is graphic design, if I didn't mention that. <laughs> okay, you ready for the next one? <clears throat> so uh, this piece is called Paradigm Shift. Yeah. Um, yes, this is a uh, fused glass uh, and each of these pieces are actually angled uh, differently, you know, different angles on the wall and um, with this uh, meltdown, um, you know, with the COVID uh, crud. Uh, I just, I was ex doing a lot of experimentation and such. And with these pieces, uh, I actually took a grinder to the glass. Um, and you have to be very careful. And with grinding, you can easily break glass. Um, and, but I, you know, it doesn't stop me because it's part, to me, it's part of the whole experience and part of the end result. Um, but it kind of uh, went hand in hand with what's going on with the COVID things seemed like the top piece things seemed like they're going along pretty okay. And then it kind of gets like, you're not sure what's going on. Then all of a sudden all hell breaks loose and so that's kind of what, what uh, this piece uh, 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 represents. And again, paradigm shift our, you know, our way of life has changed. It's different. We have a new normal and um, my all my pieces in this show really are more conceptual pieces and you know whereas I normally do functional or sculptural uh, pieces so this kind of is it's a lot of what I was feeling during the the uh, uh, two months sabbatical that I took so. all right um, I will bring up the next piece And this is a uh, perspective. So on my little, my sabbatical that I took, um, I am always uh, taking photographs. I just, I'm, you know, I, I look at a bug on the ground. I look at, you know, the way the, the dirt moves, you know, with the water and, and I'm, I always see art. Um, so when I was away, uh, I took, tons and tons of photos. So I just kind of went through uh, a lot of, of uh, the images and picked a few and, um, you know, made this perspective. Um, again, you know, I was, my head was all over the place with really what was going on. What, what, what does this mean? You know, the, um, both my studios shut down. I couldn't teach. That was this is my way of life. What what am I going to do? So I had all I, up down all around whatever. But I had a wonderful place to go um, with my family and uh, just kind of create. So I was doing all kinds of stuff when I was away, uh, cooking, baking. I haven't baked in years. Um, helping my brother repair a dock. I went to an alpaca shearing. Um, I just. Just was exploring some primitive shoreline and some uh, uh, empty old barns. And uh, then of course, when I come back here, these wonderful buildings we have here, I took tons of pictures as well. But just, I wanted to kind of have a little selection of kind of uh, some of the emotions, et cetera, that I was going through. So that's perspective. These are all actually printed on glass. Can you tell us a little bit about that process, Sandy, how you print on the glass? Uh, yes, I, di I did not print them myself, but this, I, you know, went uh, searching for a vendor because 
when I, like I said, I have so many images and I was trying to decide how I wanted to present them. And <coughs> I didn't want to just print them on paper. Uh, I was looking into metal, actually having them printed on metal. Then all of a sudden I'd be like, duh, you're a glass artist. <laughs> print them on glass. <laughs> so um, I found a place that, I, that looked good to me. I did some tests um, and uh, I was pleased with what they did. So I went ahead and got the rest done. So it's actually, uh, sprayed the uh, image is sprayed onto the glass and then they um, coat it with white and then it's uh, uh, backed with a black foam. <laughs> Sandy, are you still there? Who, me? Yeah, sorry, your feed froze up for a minute. Oh, yes, I'm, I'm still here. <laughs> Okay. Well, that was great. Thank you. I have a question for Sandy. Yes. Sure. Go Sandy, ahead, Carol. I noticed that the, there are three, three tiles are uh, kind of outside of the, the in, you know, the the grouping, and, and they're they tend to be like black and white. Was there a, a reason for that? That's a very good observation, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was just kind of me. Just not quite, you know, I just didn't know where I fit. I didn't know with everything, like I said, going on. It was, I just was, you know, am I still going to do this? Am I going to do that? Where am I going? But yeah, ex excellent observation, Carol. Oh, is that your, I like it. Is that your shadow? Yeah, actually, uh, the, the little kind of uh, sun, flower, star thing, um, I, I made out of, cool stuff in the in the dirt or sand actually it was in the sand in my brother's yard and I always do stuff like that I love like mosaics you know on the beach you know you could grab shells and whatever cicada shells and stuff like that so I made that and then I just was standing over I'm like, oh look at that it's like right you know right on my shirt or whatever so I just was playing around with shadows and stuff and then the coloring you know um and then knocking some down to black and white and and uh, yeah, so it's it's just cool. a little symbol, a kind of a symbol, you know, of this is at towards the beginning of my, you know, taking my two months off. So. Very neat. Thanks. Okay, our next piece is Petrified. Ooh. Yes, petrified, and that's again, you know, I look at it and it kind of reminds me it could be petrified wood or I don't know if there's such a thing as petrified stone. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But, you know, that was again one of my, you know, feelings when I was looking at it. I'm like, oh my God, petrified. Like, I, I, I'm petrified. I'm not sure what's going on. But this actually was, um, I did several of these. Uh, before I took off, I, I was in my studio for two, two and a half weeks, and I was slamming. I was just making all kinds of stuff, not quite knowing where, what the end result was, but I just knew I'm going to be able to, you know, use um, these pieces, I'm, or hopefully use these pieces I'm making. So this was one of the first ones I made, and um, if you haven't, you know, figured it out, that's where I got the image for my marketing piece, this, you know, taking this, before I put the little goodies on top. <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah. So, um, and then there's a, a cool metal stand that uh, my my uh, boyfriend texts and some of you know. Um, I designed it and I told him I wanted to look like this. And you know, while I was away, I was you know sending him my specs and uh, you know telling him everything you know how I'd like it done uh, for this to, to fit into. It, and I just love it. And actually, this is this. The stand is adjustable, so it can go up a little higher. It can go down and up a little higher. So I put it where I wanted it. <laughs> Very cool. I didn't, if you can see uh, Sandy's feed there, uh, Petrified is right behind yeah. her on her left, our right. Yeah. And actually, I have some pieces that go with it that I didn't have. But I ha actually have some pe Petrified pieces that actually go with this piece. Yeah, that very cool that I didn't have in my photo. 
Very nice. Thank you. Okay. So uh, next we have a, an image of the pieces that are behind Sandy right now. Um, Ooh. Oh, yes. My favorite color. Yeah. <laughs> I knew you'd say that, Carol. <laughs> um, yeah, this is um, a, a series of, of pieces that I started making, like I said, before I left. And then I completed once, once I got back. But um, there's, you know, different shapes, sizes, textures, um, techniques. Um, I love experimenting. I love, love, love experimenting. I love making my own glass. Um, so I just, again, was just making all kinds of pieces. And as you can see, they're, they, they pretty much match. So I must have been in that, you know, that color uh, scheme in my head. Um, and so I thought, you know what? I'm just, I, I think this is going to be a perfect uh, uh, wall installation. I'm going to just put them all up. And so it does look, it could look a little busy or a little like wacky or, or puzzling or whatever. So I named it Perplex because I, that's kind of what I was feeling as well. <laughs> Love it. So yeah, there's several pieces and actually they're all backed with um, acrylic. Um, so if there's any transparent pieces or if there's any translucent pieces, you know, you get light through it too. So that's real nice. And some of them, you know, are, are against the wall. They might be, you know, half inch out. Some of them are, are maybe um, close to two inches away from the wall. So, but yeah, I have a lot of different textures and, and um, you know, smooth, uh, like satin looking um, and some a little shinier and so. So to, to get this uh, effect for the textures, is this uh, kiln forming? Yes, this is all kiln forming, what you see. Yes. Can you tell us a little about the kiln forming process? I think probably a lot of people think that only ceramic artists use kilns. Oh, okay, sure. Um, no, what I do is uh, cut up pieces of glass, basically, and you know, pile it on top of each other, next to each other, um, and then put them in the kiln. So a lot of what you see here was done uh, up to temperatures probably 1475 um, for say holding for 20 minutes so that's getting it nice and flat uh, there's all kinds of different techniques here which i just happen to have okay like here's some whoopsie, here's something that i might make a pattern bar okay so this is just a bar of glass that i can actually take and chop into little quarter inch pieces Okay, or I should say widths. Okay, and that I can use a line of this, you know, next to say warm white and maybe turquoise on the other side. So that gives me a, a nice little component to you. These actually in some of these tiles that are up here. Uh, I use the, the um, pattern bars. Um, there's also where I stack glass. So these are some cabochons here, okay? So this is just a matter of stacking glass, holding it up, firing it again, rounds. And then in those same tiles, I also had some what's called vitrograph poles, and you can either make cane, so you can make thicker pieces, okay? So here's some vitrograph poles, and that's where I put a glass in a pot um, and put the pot in a kiln that's up in the air and get up to molten temperatures and then you can actually pull the, the glass out and you can use these as is like I used in, in those two tiles. I use them straight but you can also do some cool wigglies and you know get all kinds of neat effects and use you know make some of these use use them as branches or stems or, or you know vines whatever you want so there's a lot of different components that you know that are made first before I can do what you see there um, and it just depends on how 
the, the temperature you fire at. If you fire at a lower temperature, you do what's called a tack view. So I might go to 1400. And that means if I have any lumps or bumps, you know, some cabochons or whatever, then you're going to actually, sh those, ca those uh, uh, the texture will show. It won't go flat. And then the last firing is called slumping. And that's where you actually shape the glass. So a full fuse, tack fuse, and a slump fuse. I feel like I'm teaching. <laughs> <laughs> well, very cool. Thank you for telling us about that. <laughs> All right. And uh, lastly, we have some vessels or plates. I, <laughs> Sandy will tell you more about them. They're vessels. That's a good, that's a good uh, explanation. These are called peaceful because that's where I have to be. I have to feel good about what's going on. You know, you have to accept it. You have to be graceful um, and, um, you know, go with the flow, as they say. Uh, my, one, of, one of my quotes that I love is last half full. So that's kind of who I am. Um, but these are some beautiful pot. These are called pot melts. Okay. So it's, again, where I put glass in a... Um, a pot of some sort. The pot has holes in the in the bottom of it, and you just kind of raise the pot up, you know, right over the um, uh, kiln shelf, and it just kind of blobs out into these cool patterns. So part of the fun is putting the glass in, seeing what you get, because you don't always know. Sometimes you you get a big blob of nothing or brown or black, <laughs> but sometimes you get some beautiful um, shapes and and uh, uh, I just, in the colors and stuff. So at any rate, this is a sculpture, basically a sculpture of the three bowls and I call it peaceful. peaceful. So. Nice, very nice. All right. I have a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> and I did, want, I, I did want to tell folks too, because I, and I think you already mentioned it, but uh, our fall classes are starting the 21st, the week of the 21st of September. We have awesome, uh, workshops and multi-week classes and everything, flame working and fused glass. Um, I know we have a mosaic class that I think uh, Anita is doing online, uh, but we got a lot of a lot of great offerings. Great, thanks, Sandy. We really appreciate you sharing with us tonight. Thank you. Um, this is normally the part where we have a little bit of uh, music for the evening. Uh, we're going to be skipping that tonight and uh, we will bring that back in October. But tonight instead we'd like to tell you briefly about uh, one of the exhibits that we have here at a Workhouse in W16, our Clay International. And Audrey's going to share some uh, photos of some pieces that are in the exhibit and tell you a little more about it. All right, so uh, this uh, piece right here is captured by uh, Workhouse's very own Deb Balistrieri, uh, in uh, which is one of the 45 pieces that were accepted into this year's uh, Clay International. It is our 10th year of having Clay International here at Workhouse, so it's a very special year for us. Um, and it's, it's, it's an especially interesting year because uh, this was definitely a time where uh, obviously the jurors were not able to see the pieces in person. Um, many of the, um, the participants who would normally have either who would have come by to drop off their artwork sent it to us instead. So, um, I mean, it's 2020 folks. <laughs> um, so outside of Deb's work, uh, we have some really outstanding pieces. Um, this is Finding Rest by Taylor Quinton. Um, the, the closing reception for this show is going to be online as, as well. So it's going to be held on the second Saturday of October, which is October 10th uh, from I believe 6 to 8 p.m. Hopefully, we will have uh, many of the uh, many of the participating artists 
also participate in the same kind of format that we have tonight, where it'll be a question and answer kind of forum. I know that about a quarter of the 45 artists are planning on attending. So that's definitely something uh, to look forward to because you'll also, you'll have an opportunity to uh, speak to these artists and ask them about uh, any uh, specific techniques that they are using. And especially because some of these pieces are, for someone who does not work in ceramics personally, it's just like, oh my gosh, like, how did you do that? That's so neat. So um, while like the information for the specs of the type of clay and the firing of the clay uh, are provided to us by the artists and are available on our website and the artists and art artist statements section of the uh, Clay International uh, webpage. Uh, definitely, it will be worth asking these artists how specifically they uh, are inspired uh, to make their artwork and how they create it. And uh, lastly, uh, we have the piece, uh, oh, I'm sorry, that last piece was uh, on, Unreal Weather by Nate Ditzler. Uh, and this piece is uh, facing the flame on the altar of dazzling per perplexity by Susan Fiegenbaum. Wow. So, uh, there are, there, there's a multitude of uh, kinds of ceramic art. We have many pieces that are in the round, in the round so that is doable from all sides. We have quite a few pieces that are uh, mounted on the wall uh, and we also have a large selection of what you could classically consider uh, vessels. So if you are available, if you are interested, uh, please join us uh, on October 10th for our uh, Clay International uh, closing reception. Great. Thank you, Audrey. Appreciate it. Um, I also want to tell you real quick before we move on to uh, Building W9 that uh, for those of you who are familiar with Workhouse and come here uh, often, we are known for our annual haunt that we have every year. Uh, this year, we're not going to let a little thing like a worldwide pandemic stop us. We are still having a haunt this year. However, it is a drive-through haunt since it's not safe to have uh, the type we usually have. So uh, if you would like to learn more about this year's haunt, please go to our website, www.workhousearts.org. There's a lot more information there. The haunt will be every weekend in uh, October. And uh, there's information on our website about uh, how to purchase tickets and what to expect for a drive through haunt. The haunt is called Haunt 2020 Nightmare Alley. Okay. Uh, move on to W9, which is our Arches Gallery artists. Our Arches uh, artists do not have uh, studios at Workhouse. They have their studios at home or elsewhere, uh, but are also juried artists at Workhouse and exhibit their work in building W9. Um, W9 is doing a group show this month, which is called Artist Choice. That means artists could pick what uh, artwork they want to display. Um, some of the workhouse artists are here with us tonight. Uh, Kathleen Bess Gilman is first going to tell you a little bit about the artists who are not here tonight, and then uh, we'll let the artists who are here, including Kathleen, talk about their work a little bit. All right, so first up we have uh, Medusa by Ann Hollis. Thank you. Um, this is Kathleen Best Gilman sharing a little bit about the next few pieces that you'll be seeing, which are on display right now in Arches Gallery in Building 9. And this piece is by Ann Hollis, and it's called Medusa Transformed. And Ann actually gave me a few paragraphs about her work, which I will read for you. Medusa Transformed is illustrating the change from beautiful woman to monster described in Ovid's Metamorphosis. In this Greek tale, Poseidon forces his attentions on the beautiful but unfortunate Medusa while she is in Athena's temple. When Athena discovers what had occurred, 
she turns Medusa's hair into snakes. So anyone who looked at her would be turned to stone. This begs the question, was Athena's reaction a punishment on Medusa or a way of protecting her, her from further attacks? It also makes one wonder, was it a painful transformation? Was Medusa thankful that people would now leave her alone? Was she at peace? Is this artwork showing relief or agony? Medusa Transformed is a mixed media artwork created with a variety of torn papers ranging from regular weight paper to tissue paper. The snakes are made from hand-painted papers and outlined with leather cording. Ann Hollis chose Medusa Transformed to be part of the Artist Choice Show since not only is it one of her favorite personal, her personal favorites due to its challenging pose, but it seemed appropriate for this monster's metamorphosis to hang through the month of October and Halloween. So the, that's a few words that the artist had to share. Awesome, uh, thank you. Uh, so now, next we have uh, Eagle by Sandra Lewin. Okay, Sandra Lewin also shared a few words about this particular piece. And Sandra is pretty well known for painting birds and other other lovely paintings. She's definitely a realist. She chose to paint the bald eagle because it's been a symbol of American freedom since the founding fathers declared it the national bird. She wanted to depict it as a majestic force of nature that it has inspired us for centuries. And I think it's lovely how she captured the eagle in flight. It looks like he's about to either capture prey or <laughs> land on his nest. He has a fish down there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. All right. Um, next, we have uh, Jean Modi, uh, Emily, and George. Uh, when I first hung, I hung this piece, I believe, in 2019. Uh, it was displayed as a diptych. Would you like me to put both images on screen or one at a time? Yeah, if you can put them on in the screen at the same time, that'd be great. And uh, Kathleen can tell a little bit about uh, the story behind uh, them because they were inspired by one of our other former Arches artists. Well, actually, Sharon, you might have to share that little bit, but I do oh, have okay. <laughs> I do have a few thoughts on this piece. Yeah, you go first, Kathleen. Okay. Um, Gene Motti, if you're not familiar with his work, he uh, is working in oil, and these are quite large. I think they're close to three feet tall, the actual pieces, and he has a really interesting take on uh, modern minimalism, because his work generally uses the primary colors you see here, and line and shape. And these two pieces are a fun modern take on those historic family members that hang over the fireplaces or decorate the walls of English manor houses. Those are uh, Jean's piece, which Emily and George face each other, so their faces are pointing uh, at each other when they're hung. Jean was, uh, Jean painted these as, as a classic. Uh, a, a modern take on a classic example of this kind of a portrait. And I'm sorry, I had it backwards. Uh, Jean wasn't inspired by another artist. Another artist was inspired by Jean. We had an artist named uh, John Hart who uh, was inspired by these pieces to create his own, but John is known for painting the bizarre and unusual. So his George and Emily were skeletons <laughs> who were facing each other. And they and Jean and uh, John enjoyed hanging their pieces together. <laughs> but uh, John has left us now. Uh, he is a Manassas artist. So occasionally you can see his work if you're out Manassas's way. And maybe you will see his inspiration of pieces based on this. 
Okay, thanks. Sure. Give me uh, okay. just a moment as I bring up the next few images. Um, next, we have, will it be Kathleen? You, it's, it's up to you. We have both. Uh, we have Carol and Julie and Kathleen with us tonight. So however you guys would like to do it. Doesn't matter. All right. So uh, I will pull up uh, Kathleen's artwork. Ooh, yeah. That was my cat, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, so we have Bluster and Calm by Kathleen Beth Gilman. Okay, and for those of you that are new to my work, I am primarily a landscape painter. And this is, as Audrey just mentioned, titled Bluster and Calm. Um, I also hail from New England, Southern Maine precisely. And so I often paint scenes that are familiar from the town where I grew up. So this is actually a, on the outskirts of a beach that is one of my particular favorites. And what you're actually seeing here is the salt marsh along the Mousam River that then leads down to the beach. The beach is actually off camera, so to speak, to the right. And I entitled this Bluster and Calm because it was, it was winter essentially. And the sky was filled with those blustering clouds, but the water was fairly calm along the river there. And uh, Kathleen is the artist who I mentioned before, who has also painted Rachel Carson Park. I think you can mm -hmm. see in this painting a little of the similarity uh, between her uh, painting and, and Phoebe Twitchell Peterson. However, they have different styles. They're just inspired by the same landscape. Mm -hmm. And I had the privilege a year ago, last summer, summer of 2019, of actually studio sitting in Phoebe's studio and building fine. And I had a great time because it's a lovely studio. And you're right. Um, we do choose similar subject matter. Sometimes I would have to explain, well, no, that's not my work. That's actually Phoebe's work. My work's over here. <laughs> <laughs> to, to me, they have very different styles, but because they paint uh, some of the the same topics, landscapes, similar topics and landscapes. I think it uh, is easy to be confused if you're not familiar with their styles. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, moving on to the next piece. This is River of Rocks. Okay, and this, this is also mine. And this is the actual beach that I maybe was teasing you with, with the last piece. Um, this is Parsons Beach in Kennebunk, Maine. And I just love going to this beach. I love walking along the wet sand where it's actually, actually easier to walk because it's been compacted by the water. And this is what the water has left behind, this scattering of rocks along the shore kind of between the high and the low tide zone, or the intertidal zone is what I should say. And I, I just love painting rocks and the, the amazing colors. You, th you think at first a rock is a rock is a rock, you know, what, what can you do with a rock? But they're, they're all different, they have different shapes, they have different textures, different colors, and it's, it's real exciting for me to paint rocks. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Another piece uh, by Kathleen Beth Gilman is Robust Pines. Mm. This is actually along the same beach. This particular beach is about a mile long, so there's a beautiful uh, possibility of taking a walk this mile long walk down toward the end of the beach where there's a spit of land where you see these particular rocks. 
And I, I tend to spend more time on this beach off season. So that's one reason you don't see people in the paintings I've made, because usually I have the beach to myself. Very often I do. Are these watercolors? This, this, what I've shown you so far, they're all acrylic paintings, actually. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about uh, if you use any special techniques for these acrylic paintings? Um, well, I, I do incorporate different acrylic mediums, usually a gel medium and sometimes a more liquid medium. I'm forgetting the, the actual term they use to describe the more liquid medium. But the mediums do make the paint sometimes a little bit more transparent. And I think that's why sometimes my work uh, looks a little bit like watercolor. And I also like to uh, build it up in, in layers, which is what a watercolor does, watercolorist does as well. I have taken some watercolor painting classes, but I don't consider watercolor my, my strongest media. So I tend to work in acrylic, sometimes in oil. And recently I've been working in pastel a fair amount. And oil and pastel are typically opaque mediums. Acrylic paint kind of bridges the gap between watercolor and oil in that it can be used to look more transparent. Well, thank you very much for, uh, for sharing that with us. You're welcome. Uh, we have My pleasure. one last piece. Uh, and this is Spitting Snow, uh, parentheses, Big House. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. And actually, this is the piece that is in the front of the gallery in our featured artist area. And so this was my artist choice. And this actually is the same beach, Parsons Beach in Kennebunk, Maine. Um, the last image of Robust Pines is a little bit more to the right of this painting. If you were actually standing on the beach, you'd be looking at rocks to the, I'm sorry, to the left, which is toward the ocean. And land side is actually toward the right. This large house is kind of a sentinel at the end of the beach. It tends to draw your attention and draw you to take that one mile walk down to this spit of land. And I actually have sold another version of this same subject matter. And the buyer purchased it because a friend of his owns this house. Now that was really unusual because the buyer was right here um, in Washington DC area. But he has a friend who owns this house in yeah. Southern Maine. And when he saw the painting, he decided it needed to be his. <laughs> so that, that was a cool. pleasure. That's astounding. That was, it, that was a pleasurable sale on my side, on my part. Um, I love it. Well, Kathleen, thanks for uh, sharing your work with us tonight. Yeah, thank you. Let's see. Um, Carol, are you, are you ready to talk for a minute? Or? Sure. All right. I'm here. <laughs> All right, we have Flower by Carol Mather. Now this is, a, this is a paint pour and I'll explain that. It's where you take paint and you mix it with a binder, binding agent. I use Floetrol a lot. You can also use Elmer's glue, believe it or not. Um, you add a little water too. You have to get the consistency of like honey dripping off a spoon. Um, the, the problem with a paint pour is it's, it's unpredictable. Um, just when you get it pour, you know, you get it on the canvas and the way you want it. This was created by putting some circles of different colors and then taking a damp uh, napkin, <laughs> believe it or not, unfolded, pressed down on the surface, and then lifting up each corner and gently raising it up and off the canvas. Uh, you would think then it's done, right? No, the paint can still move. And so you have to be very patient and you have to be forgiving because it does have a kind of a mind of its own. Now, I don't usually work a lot with red because red is very overpowering and it can kind of take over. Uh, I don't know how the rest of you feel about red, but that's kind of the thing. But I, I kept thinking, what am I going to call this thing? And I, then I remembered 
when I was in high school, I was, it was sort of during the hippie era. <laughs> and, you know, you saw a lot of those crepe big flowers that they were made out of crepe paper and stuff. And that kind of reminded me of that. So I thought flower power would be a pretty, pretty good explanation of it. Now I did add, you can, um, you can enhance these kind of paintings when you, when you let them fully dry, you can then add elements to it. Um, you can either paint on top of it. Now I added, I added the stamens that are in the center. That was added after it dried. Um, you can even add uh, figures. You can add, I mean, it's amazing the, the, the versatility of paint pours. If you ever want to see the kind of versatility of paint pours, just go on uh, YouTube and, and just put in paint pour. And my God, it just explodes. There's so That's many it. different ways to, to work with a paint pour and, and manipulate it. But as I said, you have to forgive yourself because if it ends up not being quite what you wanted, <laughs> you have to kind of be ready to adapt and, and make it into something that, uh, that you really want to have. So at first, I didn't really know that I liked this when it first uh, was finished. And I looked at it and thought, eh. But then it started to grow on me. So um, I, I think it was okay. I, I think it turned out well. Um, but uh, anyway, that's, that's the fun of it. I, I really feel like this one, <clears throat> there's so much red that it almost moves into the background, like the black, and it's the turquoise and lime green that really pops out as no, the accent. I, I, exactly. It just, it just really, it, it just happened that way. Um, what you do when you're, you're first working with the colors, you can also do like what they call a flip cup, where you, you put the different color paints into the cup, and then you, you flip it over on the canvas, and then you, you lift it up and let it just float out and, and create different kinds of, uh, it's a just ma amazing patterns that you can create with a paint pour. Uh, you can add silicone to it to create. This one uh, created its own silicone. I didn't add silicone. If you see the little circles on there, a the little uh, vacant spaces there on the black, you know, where the turquoise is, yeah. that, that's actually, um, that turned out to be a cell, what they call a cell. Um, you can create cells by adding silicone. The only problem with that is when it completely dries, you have to get rid of that silicone. It rises to the surface of the painting. You have to get rid of that before you, um, if you're going to seal that painting, you can't seal it with that silicone still on there. You're going to have to wipe it off and get rid of it. Some people use flour. They'll put flour on the surface of the canvas and then wipe it off. Uh, I've seen people use that technique. Um, I use a little bit of uh, rubbing alcohol. Um, it, it's just different ways you can do that, but you've got to be prepared. There's going to be a little work involved if you're going to use silicone to create additional cells. Yeah, very cool. Carol, thanks so much for sharing. Sure, it was fun. <laughs> and then uh, we've got one last Arches artist with us tonight who is our newest Arches artist. If you're familiar with Julie, uh, she used to be in building W5 and has now moved over to Arches. Joy, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank Joy? you for having me. Oh. Yep. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> well, sorry. Uh, uh, this piece is uh, Death of a Child by Julie DeKevitz. Um, if, if you know my art, you know um, I'm a political painter. Um, we just came across the anniversary of September 11th, and um, that actually was the day when I started painting um, about current events and what was happening. And I, we all have our September 11th story, but I was actually working on something about kind of flowers, something really cheerful, you know, in my home studio. And I got so many calls saying, turn on your TV. And then I was so affected by September 11th that I started painting. Um, about that event and that kind of took me on my current path. Um, I have a great sympathy for women and children so usually my painting um, has to do with that. This, this painting is in response to um, the children at our border that have been torn from their mother's arms and thrown into prison. Um, we know some of them have already died of, of illness or just even dehydration and as a mother myself um, it's very painful to imagine what it must be like to have that circumstance. So um, the, the faces, the, the big faces are on silk. 
And underneath it, you can't quite see in this photo, but there is a mother there and she's grieving. And at the bottom are her little children. And it's, it's like a river of these children that are going by that um, are being lost, you know, even as we talk. So um, that is the story behind this one. It's, it's mixed media, so it's encaustic with, uh, with uh, silk and then um, a type of wax crayon. Thank you. All right, next we have, this one is called uh, Death on a Train. So in, in 2004 in Madrid, there was a train, a commuter train bombing where um, 193 people died. And I was, I was musing on that train bombing because um, everyone, everyone was on that train, people of different religions and persuasions, just the everyday commuter. So we have in the center, you can see the death figure, he's, you know, he's wearing the black robe. And then um, you see different religious figures there because the, um, the terrorist who bombed the train may have been of one certain religion target targeting others, but like pretty much everybody was caught up in that train bombing. Um, so it's kind of a tribute to those people. It's, it's kind of inspired by sort of medieval art with, you know, what you see in maybe a Bible or something where you've got this really ornate border and then um, you have the images in the center. This, this is when I was painting in oil and um, so you'll, you'll see it's, uh, it's an oil painting. Uh, Julie, I know uh, I've noticed the uh, flowers around the border and uh, do these specific flowers uh, have a meaning in context to this event? Well, I, um, not, not specifically, although we, flowers are a typical symbol of when someone dies, like, you know, we give flowers or we use flowers to memorialize them. So it, it, um, that was basically the idea. Thank you for asking. All right, thank you. Uh, and next we have Katrina. I don't know if people remember back in 2005, uh, Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans and um, we saw images of, of people, you know, standing on top of their houses with massive flooding and there was the Superdome where um, other people spent time. So here we have our figure holding onto a branch. Um, we see like the, the, the two strips are actually the prints, woodblock prints that I made that kind of just so chaos or I guess a chaotic environment. Um, the idea is with that feeling, like, and we could almost feel a little bit that way now where you have no control, things are just feels like, you know, they're randomly happening and Due to global warming, you know, we're having these massive events that affect huge communities. And it's, uh, once again, this is an oil painting that um, was done back in 2005. Uh, thank you. That's my, the end of my paintings for this time. Well, before you before you go away, Julie, uh, as Audrey mentioned before, you have an exhibit in W16. Want to throw in a little plug, plug for it tonight? Well, it's, it's called the right to vote. And we look at um, how women gained right, the right to vote and their, their stories. And I, um, I actually just gave a talk about that over Zoom today to another women's group. And it, it was titled Empowering Myself with History and Art because um, when I came here to the workhouse, I did not know any of these stories and it literally wafted through my studio door as Irma Thornton, our historian, would tell the stories of what women were imprisoned here and what happened to them. And as I sat there painting, I'm listening in and I'm like, I don't know that story. Like, wow, that's really interesting. <laughs> so the, the paintings, they're, they're dark, but they're, they're slightly humorous, you know, with the other, those other Katrina ones won't, but we'll, one is like suffragists and zombies. So the idea is that 
people way back when were kind of like zombies because these women would just be standing there in front of the White House protesting with their sign and they're not even saying anything and mobs would attack them and tear down their signs. So, you know, it's a bit of a humorous take. And there's another painting called The Story of the Ham, which has <laughs> to do with a very, very funny story. That is true. I read it in Dora Stevens' book called Jail for Freedom, where suffragists were imprisoned at the district prison. They went on a hunger strike to protest their treatment and the the district commissioner of the prison, Mr. Brownlow, he swore he knew, I know how to break these women from this strike. So he hired six chefs to cook ham night and day because he was convinced there was no more enticing fragrance in the world than smelling ham. And he just <laughs> knew these women would break. They'd break whatever they're doing for a slab of ham on a plate. Um, Sadly, like no women ever broke for a piece of ham, but the story was <laughs> funny enough that it actually um, created a big, I uh, created a big painting from it. And the last painting I'll plug, um, I specifically made it for like women with kids and all that. It's called Saxon the Suffrage Cat. It has to do with an adventure. Um, Nell Richardson and Alice Burke traveled across the country and they're little golden flyer, their car, and they adopted a kitten on the way called Saxon. And Saxon became a bit of a um, event. So when they would stop at a town, the newspapers would get pictures of Saxon the cat along with these women. And they, you actually could watch the kitten grow up as the news stories went on. So yeah, so that painting uh, stars a cat and it's very bright and cheerful. <laughs> And it's celebrating because um, we should celebrate that we have the right to vote as women and, and currently we still have got it. That's great. Thanks, Julie. Thanks Julie, so much. Julie's exhibit is tied to the uh, anniversary of the 19th Amendment ratification, which we are sub celebrating at Workhouse this year. As, as Julie alluded to, for those of you who aren't familiar with Workhouse's history were called Workhouse because uh, our campus is the former site of the DC Federal Penitentiary. Um, the women's uh, prison was across the street from where our current location is. And uh, a lot of uh, suffragists who were arrested in DC were held at Workhouse. And frankly, the torture they experienced here is what helped to get us ladies the vote because once it became public what was happening, people were appalled and public opinion really changed in their favor. So Julie, thanks for being with us tonight. And uh, everyone at the Arches, thanks for sharing. And uh, thank you. <clears throat> Julie's show is going to be on view in W16 in the Vulcan Muse Gallery on the first floor until January 10th. Uh, and you can visit our campus to see it uh, Friday through Sunday from noon until 5 p.m. Thank you. Okay, we've got one last artist with us tonight with, with our uh, last but not least building W10. Uh, the featured artist in W10 this month is Jane Johnson and Jane is with us tonight. Uh, her show is called A Mix of This and That. And Jane, would you uh, like to talk about your work? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Great. Okay, um, my work is all mixed media and my show, a mix of this and that is because um, when I'm painting, I let the painting take over and let the painting tell its own story. I found that as I'm working on a painting, if I decide it's going to be something and it wants to be something else, that if I try to fight it, it turns into a b ugly um, painting and it ends up in a corner of my studio. And so what I do is I um, paint and I'm a process driven painter and I start out with acrylic and then I add collage and I draw back into everything. And as the painting's progressing along and I'm like building and building, um, I then start taking photographs of my work and when I'm taking the photographs of my work, I will see lights and darks and different things in there. And then things also so, sort of start to form as what I'm painting on or what I'm working on. And I use the photographs to help guide me through how I'm working on the painting. So some of my work is abstract. Some of my work is figurative 
and some of my work is floral. So I've got a combination of all three of those in my show at the moment. Very nice. All right, so the first piece we have on screen uh, is Dance of Leaves. And this piece I worked on last year, I worked on it, I was in a residency last year in Rhode Island. And this is the painting, one of the paintings I completed there. Um, this had been something else. I'm often painting over old paintings. I'll have old paintings that when I look at them, they just don't speak to me anymore, or I see something that I really feel like I need to change. And so I decided to change that painting and it ended up being this. And um, I'm really pleased with the way it is. It's almost like it has a, a structure or almost like it's a, an abstract sort of landscape with the fall uh, colors in it and then leaves sort of, you know, on the edges of the rocks or the edge, you know, like on the trees that you can see, you know, so that's what that is. And it's all mixed media. Okay, thank you, Jane. Our sure. next piece is in a swirl. And in a swirl is another painting that has had more than one story. Um, and originally it was more like a big wave um, swishing around and wasn't really, I'm not a blue painter. Blue is not my favorite color to work with. And so I maybe probably because the blue just didn't make me happy. I went back and I painted over it again and it came out with this and it's got all these wonderful swirling sort of motion in it and a lot of uh, different um, stencils and different things in there and I also drew a lot of circles in there and so it's very richly textured as well as it's got these really interesting play of patterns across the surface. I'm always working with patterns and textures and colors. Jane, you mentioned in your exhibit statement that uh, you, in the course of creating a piece, you will stop and photograph it and yeah. um, analyze your photos and go from there. Can you tell us a little bit about that process? Yeah, well, what I do is, I, um, and, and when I teach, I also tell my students to do this as well. But what I do is I will take photographs. I'll put down, my paintings generally have over 50 layers on them wow. <laughs> and um, I just build and build and build I almost say I'm more of a builder than a painter and um, as I'm building on the painting I take photographs and I look and I'm always looking at values which means lights and darks I always go and look at lights and darks and see where the lights and darks are and how it holds everything together and when I'm doing that, I also will see images start to emerge. That's how I ended up with my geisha figures. Um, some figures started to emerge in my paintings and I ended up creating geisha figures from those. But the, by looking at the lights and darks and by looking at the photograph, it's almost like it gives me another set of eyes on the painting because it's very um, you know, non-objective when you're looking at the photograph. So um, it helps to really guide you because you can see other images in the painting. Very cool. Thanks for telling us a little bit about sure. that. Our next piece is Ladies' Night Revisited. And in this one here, this is another painting that was one that I had worked on before and went back. It was, it was a picture and you could see these kind of abstract figures of all these women, like one looked like she might even be in a bathtub. And, um, and one was like a head with a big hoop earring. And um, it was older, it was like four or five years old and it just needed to have a new life. And so I got it and started working on it. I always use some of the, some of the information from the previous painting to work on for the new painting. And this particular painting has, had, other painting had some gold in there, some gold um, 
paper and stuff and you can still read some of that in this painting as well as some of the textures that I had there before. But, but I really uh, went back and played with the colors and um, you can see, if you squint, you can see how the big dark areas sort of pull the painting together. And um, that's what I was looking for. Nice. Jane, I want to ask you one more question uh, based on something you wrote in your show statement, exhibit statement. You talked about uh, Sargent's magical stroke of color and uh, yeah. you met John Singer Sargent. Can you tell us a little bit about the magical stroke of color and how you apply that to your work? Well, with Sargent, like I always think of that um, painting of the girl with the, um, I think it's the pink sash that it's it may be the girl with the purple elevens or sash. But anyway, she has this uh, big, beautiful white dress and the beautiful um, sash in it. And he just, the way he uses like a stroke of color to accent the edge of a skirt or just a stroke of color that accents her um, beautiful sash on her dress. He uses just a pop of color somewhere to really make something sing. And that's what I try to do in my paintings. I try to put a pop of color somewhere to really make it resonate. And um, he also uses that pop of color in like multiple locations. And that's what I try to do. I try to make sure that I have at least three areas of color that help pull the painting together and that make that whole painting pop with the color. Very cool, thank you. Sure. All right, uh, next we have Scribble Scrabble. And Scribble Scrabble is um, one that I did last year. And I used a whole lot of, I um, used a Japanese uh, paintbrush to make a lot of marks in it. So it's more of, um, it's got almost like a written sort of image or, you know, some abstract letters in it. I also use some, I use a lot of stencils sometimes when I'm painting. And so with this, I um, used some stenciling with some letters and some numbers that's all in there. So it's a lot of different, like, it's like somebody sat down and scribbled all over a piece of paper or something. And um, I used a lot of different mark making and everything in this painting. And I really love the way that the color is held together. Here again, if you kind of squint, you can see where I've used my darts and my lights to kind of hold the painting together. And um, this is a real fun piece, I think. Yeah, it is. A lot of strong primary color in there. <laughs> yep. But I try to, I never try to use color straight from the tube. I'm always um, working with mixing and mixing and mixing and playing with colors. And um, I use a sheet of um, freezer paper that I can, and I might take a color out four or five or six times before I actually get to the color that I want to use on the painting. Ah, interesting. Hmm. Starting from the base. Nice. All right, our uh, final piece from Jane Johnson is going to be Swimming Upstream. And this particular painting is called Swimming Upstream because I didn't notice it when I was working on it, but after I finished it, there was clearly a fish in this painting. <laughs> and um, you see the fish is kind of highlighted. It's going up to the upper um, left-hand corner of the painting. It's like it's um, jumping up, you know, over the rocks and everything. And this is a real fun piece. Um, did this a couple of years ago. I was uh, demonstrating to my students that I wanted to, um, talking about using more of a monotone kind of range of colors. And um, I was demonstrating using all yellows or all colors related to yellow in this one. And um, you can't see it in this particular picture. But one of the things that I really love about this particular painting, and this is all mixed media, so there's collage and all sorts of different things in there. But one of the really cool things about this painting is that I, uh, with using freezer paper, I always 
will have skins that I can peel off of my freezer paper. I'll let the paint build up and build up and then I'll peel it off and I'll have all these surprise little bits and uh, treasures that are fun to save. And I keep a box full of um, skins and I'll go back and when I'm working on a painting, I'll go back and I'll tear up, you know, go through there and find a piece that makes it really, you know, interesting. And so there's this little tiny little piece in there and it's got a little pop of teal on it. So it's a really, and it's a raised kind of cap feeling, a cap shape. And then it's got this little piece of teal out of it, popping out of it. So it's kind of a fun little detail on this painting. That is very cool. It has a lot of depth despite being all in the same color range too. Yeah. So, and that's, you know, that's just a range of different things. Like one of my favorite colors that's in this is I always love to mix yellow and black together to make a nice olive color. And I use that in here. And I think that adds a nice little bit of depth. Great, wonderful. Jane, thanks so much for sharing with us tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, well, everyone, that is the conclusion of our virtual second Saturday, and that's all the buildings we have on campus. We have six artist buildings. Um, we skipped W8 tonight because we have been focusing on clay a lot, and we'll be again next month. But I want to thank everyone who joined us tonight, all the artists. Uh, if you are interested in any of the artists and seeing more of their work, please check out the chat feature on here. I've sent uh, contact info for a number of the artists. Uh, I want to thank Audrey Miller for hosting tonight. Thank you so much, Audrey. Yeah, thank Yay. you for having me. Yay. <laughs> and uh, again, if you'd like to see any of the work you saw tonight in person, Workhouse Art Center is open uh, Fridays through Sundays, noon to 5 p.m. Uh, Saturday is a great day to come because be for uh, for at least the rest of September, we have a community market that we are running in the quad of uh, campus. And it starts at nine o'clock and ends at one. So if you come a little later uh, in the community market time period, you not only will get to go to the market, but you can also then uh, go in our artist buildings when they open at noon. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us tonight. And Dale Marhanka, our interim director, says thank you to everyone as well. I see his note there in chat. Uh, thanks for joining us. And please come again next month. We'll have more information coming in a couple of weeks in our e-blast and our Facebook page about our October second Saturday and also about a closing reception for Clay International, which Audrey will be hosting next month. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night everyone. Good night. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye. Bye.